हरियो 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 हेलो माय फ्रेंड्स देयर इज अ लॉन्गिंग इन एवरीबॉडी देयर इज अ लॉन्गिंग फॉर कंप्लीशन we may push it aside we may cover it up we may do what we want somehow there is always this longing for something we don't quite know in the mind what and so it's easy in the mind to come up with all kinds of ideas how to fulfill that like something is not quite right something is missing maybe i should do this maybe i should get this career maybe i should get that possession maybe i should do this that enjoyment <laughs> yeah. momentarily it appears that it works when something is fulfilled but then it comes back there is a longing deep down we know something could be totally different somehow our life may be all right compared to what we see around we learn to say okay i should not complain <laughs> and yet there is a longing a longing for something more for something deeper for something beyond this longing is there because naturally we are not a limited person we are not the role that we are playing however glorious the role may be it still not capable of fulfilling that longing for being aware of what really is deep down something is completely continuously nagging there is so much more as long as we don't know where this is coming from then people are restless and trying to do so many things filling up feel that sense of something is missing fill it up with all kinds of things and it never works the drive comes back we can learn to just put the attention on that longing and let that longing guide us back home to the our to our own true nature the more religious person may have a longing for god wanting to see god wanting to feel god wanting to communicate with god wanting to unite with god this is perfectly valid for that divinity that we want to contact consciously when we are crying to god when we are longing for god is our own divinity you are a divine being essentially potentially you are divine and as long as we are not aware of it that longing is there because deep down we know this is our home this is our birthright we can live experience so totally different 
We need not feel separate and cut off and being in pain all the time because of it. But we can connect consciously with that well of beingness, with that well of joyousness, with that well of creativity and beauty that wants to express itself. As long as we hope that something will come from somewhere to, to fill up that hole, to fulfill that longing, then we are running and running and running. If we stop doing that, if we just bring the attention back to the longing that is there and sink in with that longing, then we can come back home to our essence. It brings us home. It brings us here. It brings us now in that timelessness. What an amazing story. What an amazing dream. You are essentially and potentially divine. And then we forget it and we struggle and struggle and struggle simply to finally become aware it has been there all the time. What we have been looking for is here, is now. What we have been longing for is just to come back to our natural state. Our natural state of pure divinity. There is nothing wrong with that longing. Sometimes some teachers say, yeah, you have to get rid of that desire for liberation. That desire in itself is an obstacle. But it's not the desire for liberation that is an obstacle. It's the desire that is done being picked up by the me, me, ego, personality, and then we have all kinds of idea what it should mean, and then we want to somehow, as a person, order divinity, order God, order the universe, to please serve us what we are looking for. Still, if that desire is coming from the source, if it's sincere, then even when the desire is mistreated like this, gradually it is purifying the mind. But as long as we hold on to all our self-importance and combine it with that desire, then it's a very painful business. But if you learn to let that go, and just connect with that longing, that pure longing for truth, for reality, for God, for the self, for what is, then that very longing in itself becomes blissful. It is not painful anymore. It's only painful when me, I want something and don't get what I want. <laughs> but if I learn to connect with that pure longing, that longing in itself is joyous. It's a promise that we just have to follow it. And it brings it, us right back to the soul. So when somebody feels restless, thinking, oh, my life is so empty, what should I do? My life is so meaningless. Don't run out and think, oh, I should find something that is really, then after that, give me the fulfillment that I'm looking for. Bring the attention back to that longing for truth, for that way of existing without feeling limited 
all the time. The power may have its limits. How much we can express that, how much we can experience that. But when we are not putting those ideas about the me and the other step, it doesn't feel limited. It doesn't feel, give that feeling, oh, I'm so small and powerless and I can't do anything and what should I do? I'm not good enough. <laughs> All that falls off. Just connect with that pure, egoless longing, longing for truth. When I was first with Hama, I was very much in that thing. Me, me, I, Werner, want something. I had all kinds of ideas what it should be. <laughs> Slowly over the time they changed. But me, 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 I want something. I wanted Hama to give me that being always pissed <laughs> that I'm not getting what I want. <clears throat> One time Hama said, but, but when I was longing for God, that in itself was so blissful and I was shocked. I said, well, well, my experience is the exact opposite. It's painful. I'm suffering. <laughs> she didn't try to give much explanation. She just said, yeah, well, the experience may be different from one to another. <clears throat> she saw that I had to go through until I was ready to get, to let go of that self-importance connected with that long. Eventually, I came to a point that I could say, yes, she was totally right. That longing in itself is joyous. That longing in itself is fulfilling. If we connect with that longing for truth, then we don't have the feeling that our time is wasted. We don't have the feeling we are not doing enough. We are not good enough. We should do, be doing something greater in the world. Then, because that longing connects you to the source. And that sense of fulfillment is there. And as you go on, it gradually becomes stronger and stronger and more and more the natural way of existing. Then the story may take its own turn and every story is different. It may gradually, gradually, slowly develop and suddenly there may be a big shift but then still from there it develops. Some people may have very quickly some kind of shift, but then it continues. And then again, some little shifts, the stories are different. Sometimes it's being told it's like this or like that. It's in one time, it's not, there is no possibility of a partial awakening or something like that, but the stories are different. There is no rule for the divinity, how it is going to manifest, how it is going to reveal itself. But if that longing is sincere, if we are connecting sincerely with that longing that is there, then it will start to happen sooner or later. If we stop holding on to that me, I want to get something. But just connect with that natural longing for truth. Then the pain of the seeking disappears. Then the idea that's basically a painful path we have to follow with a lot of suffering, a lot of trouble, a lot of pain, until finally we get to a point where everything is glorious and beautiful. All these ideas disappear 
because the more that awareness is there, that there is a pull, a call, calling us home to the essence. It's always there. If we simply listen, if we don't close our ears and say, I can't hear anything, <laughs> but if we simply listen to that call from within, then these ideas of the path is painful and suffer. it's nothing but suffering disappear. And it became, becomes a joyful journey, going from moment to moment, from day to day, and the heart is getting broader and broader. Okay, my friends, I stopped just talking away from addressing you. Is there anyone here who would like to say something? You're welcome to come in. Hello, Floyd. Hi, everyone. Hello. Yes, how, how are you? Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, like uh, earlier, I used to see, you know, that this longing is there and it's not getting fulfilled, that kind of thing. And we try different methods or we try different satsangs or healing or whatever, you know, to get out of this so-called misery, then, then I changed my understanding a bit. I said, whatever I'm doing, I have to do it without any expectation. Mm -hmm. And maybe what I did in the last 10, 15 years, I'm seeing the result now, you know? So eventually, you know, whatever I'm doing, it will give a cumulative effect over <clears throat> a period of time. So there's no need to actually sort of uh, worry about it, uh, you know. So, but then, you know, the mind, sometimes it will get into different tracks, you know. Sometimes it will say, okay, fine, I am spiritually, I'm sorted, but let me try something in relationships. Let me try something in the career. You know, so is this uh, like a natural thing to try and fail and then learn from that failure, you know? Or is it something that, uh, you know, some people in India, especially they say, you know, that uh, you have to dedicate your life to spirituality. Like you have to just go into it full on, like meditate for hours a day or do something which is very intense. Because if that effort is not intense, it means that you are not fully dedicated to the path. So how do you see this? Like with other questions, you cannot say it's like this or like that. Mm. It's different from one person to another. It needs a total dedication. That is true. But that doesn't mm. mean that uh, now everybody has to spend their time for spiritual practices only. The dedication is to be open and awake, no matter what we are doing. Mm -hmm. And if then it's one's story, one's destiny, that you get into a relationship, then you get into a relationship. With when it's one, yeah, but some we person, try for it, you know, like we try to make it happen. Okay, fine, spiritual yeah. department fulfilled. Now let's try on this department. Right. But that means the spiritual department is not more so pressing like there, but somehow there is still the longing for something more. And then it's projected on, uh, okay, let's yeah. try with a relationship, let's try with a career, study something and have a career, let's try with something or other. But mm. actually, even there, the motivation behind it is that somehow or other, 
there is that sense of something could be better. So let's mm. go for it. If a, if a desire is there, if it's strong, then I guess it has to be fulfilled. But then let, fulfill it consciously. Go, with, go for it and remain awake and remain conscious. And then experience the sweet and the bitter fruits that come out mm. <laughs> when we go for it. And then you also spiritually keep on unfolding and learning and growing. If we go then mm. and completely forget and are again totally half asleep in our story, then we have to make or do quite a long period of pain and suffering until that wake up call comes again. But if you go already clear and awake, and see, okay, it's on the path that there is uh, <clears throat> maybe a relationship on the road or anything that comes and it's strong. If you feel it's just a momentary desire, you can watch it, you can relax it, you can let it go and it doesn't bother. But if something is there that is a bit nagging, insisting, then it's mm. better, okay, accept this part of the story of this human appearance, so let me go, but not get asleep again, not forget that wakefulness again. And then when you go like this into a relationship, then uh, you may benefit greatly from being with somebody and having to deal with all the consequences that come along with it. But if we are awake, then we can accept that whatever challenge comes is always a possibility to become more self-aware, to learn, to grow. But what do you mean when you say go awake into it? Like, uh, how, how can it be understood that I am awake in something which I am doing? Right. That what I mean is that uh, even if you go for it, that you still keep on reminding yourself to be with yourself here now, that you observe, mm. that you are not just completely putting all your attention in the externality of the story, mm. of the details, and get the game completely lost in it. But no matter mm. what is happening, that you still remind yourself, yes, but there is that aspect here now that is actually not affected by any of this. Hmm. Right. Yeah. Recently, I went to a human design reader. I don't know if you've heard about human design. No, it's I don't like know what a, this is. <laughs> yeah, human design is, it is based on astrology, I Ching and ancient concept, but they give you like a, a psychological description of yourself, of your nature. Uh -huh. You know? But it's not not like astrology where they predict much, but they tell you, you know, certain ideas based on chakras or centers and, you know, something like that. So, uh, so I learned from that there's something like a gate 40 or something like that. And there, you know, that you go into external situations. I go into external situations. I give 100%, like you said, you know, getting involved in the external externality of it. And then, you know, somewhere it feels, oh, okay, I've given too much. Now it's gone into negative. Yeah. And then you sort of have to come back and, you know, run to Tiruvannamala or something, you know. <laughs> and then you say, okay, maybe that thing was not for me at all, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So how does one sort of... So they suggest that, you know, you make enough time for yourself so that your sadhana or your rest is not compromised. Yeah, you know, and you inform the people who are involved in your situation that this is my way of doing things. So, how do you, what would you suggest for someone like that? Because I've failed many times because of this, mm. like uh, with work, with uh, different projects, service, seva, everything, you know. Mm -hmm. It's a repeating pattern. Yeah. But every time you learn something, every time, <laughs> it made you confront yourself more. Anyhow, what I suggest is that whatever, no matter what you are going for, 
that uh, still you continue to spend every day some time where you are not busy, where you are not involved, where you are as good as possible, just consciously alive, awake here now. <clears throat> and then if you do that every day, it's like you creating a current that is easily accessible. And even after that, you are when you are in full action, then when you become aware, I have been completely absorbed. All that is needed is to relax and you are right back. So if you have that capacity, that discipline to still, no matter if what you are doing, when you are going for external projects, that you still keep up a certain discipline of practicing every day sometimes, of just being quiet sometimes, in one way or another, well, however you are doing it. <clears throat> and then it's much easier also to remember what I said, go in, to go for it awake. When you are in the action that you remember, not to completely abandon that awareness that there is that aspect that actually doesn't really care about any of this. It's observing, but it's unaffected, unconcerned, and somehow getting enriched for the experience, but not being affected by it. That you not lose that thread. And it's much easier to not lose that thread if we have every day sometime, even if you go for projects that you have sometime where you just can be quiet. Hmm. It's not that you but have then to go on for hours. You can very well reduce it, but a little time every day is much more than not at all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's not that I don't get time for sadhana or something like that. I get the time, I do it. But somehow, then, you know, there's a sort of... Uh, in the moment, you know, when I'm with people or when I'm in the situation, there is maybe, you know, something which can come up unconsciously. Mm -hmm. Like I may say something to someone and then that sort of, you know, yeah. takes away the enthusiasm or the harmony or something happens. And then I feel, you know, okay, maybe I will not break this pattern. So maybe I should just not involve in this. Yeah. Well, now, if... after some time it comes up, you know. Yeah, if that, that drive to be involved and, uh, and be active in one way or another is there too strong, then uh, you cannot really push it away. It has to somehow yeah. manifest. But it comes by, again after something. Even if this happens, but what you say that, oh, okay, you got a bit carried away, maybe you say things to people that. Uh, we're not so fortunate, but the moment you become aware, oh, oh, got me again, then never mind, it's already passed. But at that moment where you remember, you just reconnect and relax mm. and do that consequently throughout the day, throughout the week, when, whenever mm. you remember, connect, be here, be now. Mm. We are always connected, but we are not consciously connected. And then consciously mm. connect and relax in that. If we do that consequently, it becomes easier and easier to maintain that awareness of that aspect mm. of you that is not involved. And it's getting easier then uh, not to get caught up in the old reactive patterns. But when it happens, okay, it happens, it's past. But when you collect yourself, okay, oh, oh. it's still strong, the mm. habit, the the momentum of the habit is still there, but then you become aware, you let go, and you are back home. Mm. Right. Well, sometimes there's a sort of uh, despondency, you know, you feel that this will, this pattern will never end. Mm -hmm. So either I should go or rather extreme and withdraw from all of this. But then when you withdraw, so you feel, okay, how many hours am I going to sit at Ramana <laughs> yeah. Ashram? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So there is something you want to also express in the world. Yes. You can do, if you have the possibility and you feel like, you can do some periods, some retreats, 
where you are mm -hmm. uh, just stepping out for some time and again uh, putting your full attention, your full energy, your full efforts, your full time into it and then go back with charged batteries and try to maintain yeah. it as good as you can. <laughs> Yeah, but usually in my case, it has so happened that the batteries are completely <laughs> discharged by the situation in a bad way. <laughs> then I run, you know, then I say, okay, fine, forget all this. Okay. But I don't the, want this. But <laughs> the more you try even to attempt to do so, to go for it, as I say, that you maintain mm. that awareness, that you are aware that there is yeah. something unaffected and just observing and you connect mm. with that, the less this will happen that you feel like the yeah. batteries are dis discharging helplessly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. You are welcome. Adio. 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 Is there anybody else who would like to say something? There comes Andreas. Hello. <laughs> Hello. What's the difference between a, like a, a true longing or like the divine nature and the selfish um, longing, which is driven by self-importance? Yes. The difference is that that true longing is simply there. We don't have to produce it. Somehow there is that call to bring the attention back to your true nature. <clears throat> Whereas when I pick the, up the ID as a person and start to have imaginations, what it should mean, then uh, it's very easy to slip into that self-importance that me, me, I want something. I want to get somewhere instead of more like, even if you are not going on the path of the devotion, still with the attitude of a devotee, just sort of opening the heart to that immensity. <laughs> and the, the, the difference is uh, in our experience. As if we go about it with self-importance, then we want something and we don't get what we want and we feel very bad about it and it's painful. If you are not doing that, it doesn't feel painful. That longing in itself becomes more and more blissful. When you talked about it, I thought that I wasn't sure if I really feel that this true longing that like I thought that yeah maybe all my attempts are kind of self-centric for and have to do something with like feeling better. Yeah. I mean, of course, that's in a way the motivation. But when the mind come in comes in that the feeling better uh, may be very shallow. But of course, we want to feel better. Because we know that there is that our true nature is blissful, <laughs> it's complete, it's overflowing, it's not simply always feeling something is totally <laughs> missing. <laughs> but then, when we mix the personality in it, then even, <laughs> even if there is a little success in a meditation, then comes in the pride and then the, the, the desire is there to go out and tell people about it and boast about it. <laughs> and then it's again counterproductive. Or even in front of ourselves, uh, then okay, I got somewhere. <laughs> this, all this stuff will come. It's, it's not that it's either one or the other. As long as we are functioning from that level of identifying with the person, with the personality, invariably, we will color whatever is there with it, and even that longing. But then, if that longing becomes painful, we can remember, hey, somehow, I guess there is something sleep, uh, sneaking in that doesn't really belong there. Uh, 
and we can see our own mechanism. It's again the same game that me, me, I want something. I want something. <laughs> and if I'm not getting it, then I'm angry about it <laughs> and reacting. And we can work on that. That doesn't mean we have to reduce the longing. It's not like some, some teachers then say, yeah, get rid of the desire. The desire for completion is perfectly natural. It comes with the natural longing, that desire not to feel caged, not to feel in bondage is totally natural. It's simply when I pick it up and give it all kinds of shapes and names and ideas and I, me, want it and I imagine that me, I, a person, should get something, then I'm a better person, then I'm above the other persons, then I'm an enlightened person amongst unenlightened persons <laughs> and all these ideas. This is all then that same old game. There is not an enlightened person. <laughs> there is no such thing. There is, I, there is that ID that I'm a person and that person is wrong. Uh, that ID is wrong. I am pure divinity. But I, as the attention is caught up in the personality, there is something nagging that knows it's not enough. And if we just let it come, and not try to push it away. And let it come and really dive into it. Then it becomes purer and purer longing. Then the self-importance will sneak in again and we can detect it and we can work on it and let it go. But we don't have to try to get low, uh, let go of the longing. That longing is fine. That leads us home. <laughs> Can you describe the let it come more, please? Sometimes you feel it's there. It's there, that sort of otherness, that, that sense of there should be more. It's like a nurse that is there, that is somewhere itching. <laughs> And then how can we let it come more? By not already starting to have all kinds of ideas. How can I do, do something in order to fulfill that? What can I do? What can I accomplish? What should I get? What, uh, what, how should I enjoy myself? What, uh, whatever comes. But then we just feel that pull. And then we can consciously open up to that. And instead of getting tense with it and wonder what can I do about it, just learn to relax in that pull that wants to pull the attention back home. Instead of getting tense and restless, learn to relax. And in that relaxation, that's what, what I mean by opening up to that. Let it come. Is it connected to surrender? It has to do with surrender. We have to surrender all the time. We can not create a total surrender. That doesn't. Uh, it's not something I, me, as a person can do. But I can at least have that concept of. I can surrender, I can let go. And then we can, in a situation where I see that I'm building up again tensions unnecessarily, I'm again uh, totally into the mechanism of the me, me personality, then I can consciously look at it and let go, relax. And that's already a little surrender. And so we can consciously surrender, partially, and whatever situation we are in, we can surrender 
the tensions that we are unnecessarily building up, letting them go, and then more and more a real surrender starts to happen. That cannot be done, but we can make ourselves available by surrendering as good as we can. <laughs> I feel that I always get carried away by my day-to-day -day business in a way and mm -hmm. <laughs> completely uh, like I meditate in the morning mm -hmm. and after a while it's good and then I feel a lot of times I feel like oh I should entertain myself a little bit or I have to go to work or whatever and mm -hmm. I complete, completely for, get sucked into this other world. Mm -hmm. Just when you come out of your meditation and before you go into the other world, <laughs> then take a time that you really intend that you want to carry that awareness as good as you can into the other way of being active, active and spending your time. And if you intend that, it will happen more and more that you become aware in the midst of the action. Oh, oh. Uh, I've completely again forgotten, but that moment you don't think, oh, anyhow, it's no use. I'm always, <laughs> I'm always forgetting, or, or that you don't postpone and think. First, I finish this, and then I try connect. <laughs> but the moment you become aware, uh, -uh as my attention was so totally again all over the place and immersed into that. At that moment, you just come home. And relax. In the midst of the action, wherever you are, whether you are walking through a crowd or whether you are sitting quietly in a train or whether you are, uh, whatever is happening, the moment you become aware, you just at that moment connect, open to connection and relax. And if you do that consequently, that memory comes more and more. And as the time goes, it's getting easier. It's slowly getting better. That's the that's the way. So nothing to complain about. <laughs> yeah. And then sometimes there comes a moment of grace. If one's really sincerely is opening up for that. Then there are always those moments when it's just simply happening. You didn't even think of opening up. It's just, wow, everything becomes silent. Everything becomes so simple and easy. And you wonder why you may not function all the time like this, because it's so simple and natural. But then the mind comes and points, builds up again the stories and goes against it and there. We think, what did I do wrong? What did I do wrong? It was, it was there. But then you didn't do anything wrong. It's just the old momentum. It's too strong and has to still be confronted and worked on. But so we can have, at, for those moments, the attitude, thank you very much for that moment of grace. It gives a good pointer the, of the direction. I only have very small moments like that, but they're never really like very, like complete. Mm. They're not like, <laughs> there's still a lot of Andreas remaining. A lot of Andreas is still there. <laughs> Anyhow, you surrender to that also? I said that, uh, okay, it, then that is also part of the divine will that somehow it's not just happening, what you said, complete, but still it gives the pointer uh, the, of the direction, how it could feel if we let go, if we don't hold on to, even in the midst of our activities. Yeah. I'm feeling a certain sadness now. Maybe that's, that's just, might this be a sign that yeah, I'm missing it too often. That I'm that I'm I'm feeling oh there is something, but I I feel like oh I cannot connect to it. 
or are forgetting it too often. You are always connected, but then we are not consciously connected. And then, yes, sometimes sadness comes, but there's nothing wrong with sadness. As long as we are not filling up that sadness again with self-importance, and then become either despondent and depressive or then totally angry about it, but then just accept, okay, there comes sadness. Not resisting against that fact that sadness is there, then the sadness is nothing wrong. Then if you are not resisting, experience consciously that sadness and relax in it instead of struggling to do something that the sadness goes away. Just accept it's there, sadness. And then sadness is not a bad experience and can become very expensive and really help you to connect. If you are not filling it up that me, me, I'm sad and I shouldn't be sad, it's not good. And, uh, <laughs> and the whole story that comes along with it. Okay. Okay. Arion, Arion, Arion. Hello, Vikas. Hello, Honor. Arion. Arion. So, uh, I would last. Uh, I would like to ask uh, regarding. I went to a place uh, called as uh, uh, Isha Yoga Ashram, mm -hmm. Coimbatore. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. there, uh, uh, he has created a Dhyan Lingam. So Dhyan Lingam is a big uh, Shiv Ling, where there he says that Sadguru says that he has made, uh, he has consecrated uh, the divine power, and all seven uh, chakras have been. Uh, included in that Dhyan Lingam. So we are all supposed to be silent and go inside and do meditation. It is very similar to the Maitri Mandir which is there in Aurobindo. Yeah. Thing is, uh, I did uh, two days of meditation there. Basically half an hour of meditation. And uh, it is so strong that once you sit there, uh, the time uh, it is like things like if you're thinking something suddenly those things goes in background and something comes inside and then the time just vanishes yeah so that divine presence is so strong yeah now my question is why are these consecrated places like why these people create like uh, tiruvannamalai itself is a consecrated place now he created this consecrated place. So one is why these, what is the importance of these consecrated places? Can we make these places in our home? Hmm. How do I create a, this consecrated place in my home? And uh, so what are the, what is the importance of this? Hmm. I want to uh, why not create it in our home? Well, it depends the living situation if there is a possibility that you have a place in your home that is uniquely for your practice, for your worship, then it can be helpful that you just keep that place only for that. Then uh, it gains uh, a certain special energy that makes it easier when you come in to connect and to meditate. If you cannot have such a place because somehow from the circumstances uh, it's not possible you still can have your corner even if there are other activities there at other times all the time still it helps and why should one do so uh, and why are these mahatmas creating places where it's more powerful just exactly for that to help people to get a support in that work the main importance is still your inner opening, your inner decision that you want to connect with truth, with the essence. 
you cannot go to uh, think that you can go and sit in such a place and then the place is doing all the job. The place is simply helping to make our effort more fruitful. So people come here to Arunachala, there is a Narunachala Puranam and uh, it says things like, if you stay and live in Ar at Arunachala, and never go farther away than 30 kilometers, then you will be liberated at the time of death, at least. <laughs> but we don't have to wait for the time of death. But people come here and live at their natural feet and then they, the mountain is doing the whole job and they just don't make an effort to be conscious and indulge into their personality as much as somewhere else. And then that is uh, missing the chance of a special place. But the special place when it's there or that lingam that you have seen there that is powerful, that can help us to make our own efforts to become self-aware, to connect with reality more powerful. So it's very, it's very useful to go visit such places, spend some time. It's not an absolute necessity, but if you have the chance and you feel like doing so, you don't have to go so out of a sense of duty that you should. But if you feel an attraction and you feel like doing such a thing, then by all means visit such places. If they help us to go more powerfully deeper into your own self. And then in your home, you have your corner, or if, you, if, if it's possible, maybe even a little room that is just for that. And then if you come in that room already, somehow you have another attitude. Uh, somehow it helps you already to tune into what you came in here for. But it's not that it's absolutely necessary. If it's possible, fine to have such a room. Why? It's simply a help. That's You asked for the reason why should one do so? Just to have a help to make your own meditations, your own efforts to go inside more effective. Uh, one more uh, last question. I also uh, like when I am doing this satsang, I again feel a lot of uh, things inside me and it's very peaceful. Mm -hmm. So I also know that there are a lot of uh, saints or siddhas who are doing things to uh, maintain the balance or do some good things in the world. If they are still doing, then how is it possible that there are so many deaths and wars and this kind of thing which happens? Why can't they control these things? Uh, I had a moment uh, not quite understood what you said. The sound was not quite... Uh, can you repeat the last sentence? Yeah, so I'm saying that there are a lot of siddhas like, yeah. uh, who are still working and uh, they are not in their physical form, but... Uh, they exist and uh, try to support people who are doing good things. Mm. But still there are so much of uh, uh, like uh, not good things, not good energies in the in the society or people who are getting killed. There is so much of uh, uh, everybody is trying to extract energy, wealth, money from everybody else. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, so everything, why it is there? Because uh, it's not only that that wonderful and divine energy that is here, but there is also other opposed energies very active. And then it's up to each one in which direction we are opening. But eventually uh, we may come out of this struggle, but right now it's extremely powerful, like a struggle between between positive energies that want to help people to be more expensive and negative energies that want to contract the consciousness. And they, 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 they want 
they don't want freedom but slavery <laughs> and if people open up the heart consciously or unconsciously to negativity then the, they are easily influenced to behave in destructive and negative ways but the, the opposite is also true if we are consciously opening up, opening up to the light to those energies you're talking about the sittas that help god that helps the powerful places that help if you help open up the heart to those energies then you also get a lot of support in your efforts to be in harmony and not to be destructive unfortunately right now uh, a, a great large portion of humanity is not very awake and is very easily manipulated into negativity and destructiveness but that should not get us depressed but inspire us even more so that much more is it important that i'm consciously opening up towards the right side towards the light that makes your life better that radiates and makes the environment better and helps also other people who come in contact with you to rather easier opening up towards the light. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Anna. Hario. 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 Is there anybody else who wants to come in? The first part of Picard's question is a bit also like the question why should it all be, why should we practice? This question actually is often asked in connection with Advaita. If people are told you are already that, you are that divinity, then there is the, often the question brings up, then why should we practice? Then why should we make an effort? <laughs> Simply because the fact in spite of that everyone is essentially that divinity, as long as we are not aware of it, then consciousness is suffering. Consciousness naturally is expansive. If we don't stand in the way of that conscious experience, that consciousness simply effortlessly expands. Then why is it not happening? Because our consciousness has been prevented by all those mechanisms that are there in the psyche, that are there in the world, that are there and prevent that natural movement of consciousness, of being expansive. All our egoistic mechanisms that we have hold on to, a lot of them we become aware, a lot of them are still there, we are not even aware they are there. They are creating this kind of tensions that lock consciousness into that bubble. And it's being locked in that bubble, turning around in that small space. And especially if the space is getting even smaller, somebody who is opening up to negativity and is getting more and more destructive, it's like the conscious experience is getting even smaller and this is painful. It makes people suffer. The value of practice is that it helps us to become aware of what is going on. That's the main point of practice, not to practice in order to achieve something, but 
through the practice we are getting the insight that is necessary to become aware how much we are preventing the natural movement of consciousness of expansion. And then becoming aware, we can start to work on it, to get rid of the habit that has the tendency to make us compel us to go again and again and again into the same traps. Even if we know that it's painful, even if we know that it's causing suffering, but out of habit, we are pulled to into it repeating the same over and over. Practice helps us to become aware that this is there. And when we are aware, there is the possibility of changing it. As long as we are not aware that it's there at all, then there is no possibility. And so is then also <clears throat> the question about why power places, why special places, because essentially reality is everywhere the same. East, West, North, South, <laughs> the essence is not changing. But how it is manifesting energetically is changing and we can very well go to places where we are getting an energetic support. It's the same thing like the practice. If we get that support, the mind becomes clearer and calmer and it helps us to get the necessary insight. If we make the effort at such a, in such a place to really connect, to look, to be honest, to see what's going on, then there is a lot of support. If you are already that, then why should you do so? Simply because we have forgotten that we are that. And this is painful, this creates suffering. And if we want to get out of suffering, then it's very totally, it very totally makes sense that we use the helps that are there. And one help, one great help, is to have every day some time where we are doing nothing else, where we can put the undivided attention simply on that to be as quite as clear, as conscious as we can here now and learn to relax in it. And if then the pull comes that we want to visit places where, that are powerful, we can very well go and get support and maybe for some time be, stay in such places and then the in, increased intensity, the increased clarity that we may experience there, we can bring them back to where we are usually and stay connected as good as we can. These are helps, there is nothing wrong accepting these helps. They are not going to do the job. We have to do the job. And the job is not simply those periods of practice I'm talking about every day. <laughs> it's not just those periods of practice. Our job is to remind ourselves to be alert throughout the day. Exactly that it's then not more so much one world and the other world, the, the practice world and the day-to-day -day world, what people call the real world. <laughs> it's not real. It's a dream, but still. It appears to be real. <clears throat> but that the job is to remind ourselves to connect no matter what, no matter where, whether we are alone or with people. And for that, practice helps. Helps a lot. Visiting power places helps. But the job is still with each one. We can get all the help, but still that is the game of being human. That is the game of starting a human story in this world. That finally it comes to each one. Every moment there is that possibility 
opening up towards the light, towards the essence, towards truth, that which is, or opening up to destructive forces. That possibility is there all the time. But nobody is going to do that for us. If the habit is there to open a lot for negativity, then it's it's being stronger and stronger in post. Then it's uh, sometimes it feels like people have not more the choice, but they are helplessly compelled to go in that direction. But if you stop, if you have a good look, that choice is always there. And nobody else is going to do so for us. That's the game of appearing in a human form, in this human game, in this world, in this time-space continuum. We can get all the help, we can get all the support, we can get all the direction. And it does help, it does support, it does give us a good direction, but finally it comes to everyone from moment to moment, whether we are doing the job. And the job is as long as the habit is there that we always get lost in our petty little stories that we learn to see that and learn not to do that anymore. <laughs> that is the job. <clears throat> okay, I'm asking you again, is there anyone? else who would like to come in and say something, you're welcome. This world is a place for confrontation. This world is an exercise place. It's a possibility to learn to grow in a very powerful way. This miracle, miraculous situation of consciousness tight your physical body. It's amazing what is going on, but uh, <laughs> we just can move a physical body as it is. That miraculous connection of matter and consciousness creates a situation that is totally ideal to grow, but we have to grab it. We have if we miss it, then it's a painful business, a painful situation. That consciousness is tied to a body and then has to suffer the limitations that come along with it. It's a painful business if we are not conscious, if we go through life half asleep. Somebody who learns to be conscious learns more and more to be relaxed, no matter what is happening. And then suddenly the experience may shift, rotate into a totally new state, a new perspective, a new experience of oneself, of the world, of whatever is. But we cannot do that, we can just make ourselves available. And we make ourselves available by what I called before, doing the job, by not going along blindly with that stream that is so compelling, that is very strong, pulling the attention of people, that stream that leads always to pain and suffering. 
and is destructive. And instead of helping consciousness to expand, make it smaller. But if we live our life and remind ourselves to be conscious, then it becomes more and more playful, joyous. That pain and that suffering is also not lost in that situation, also something grows, but it's a slow process and it's a very painful process. We need not go into that if you are alert. It's a, and somebody, even if in the lifetime, lifetime there is not the, a huge shift into a new state of existence, but there is a lifetime and somebody has opened again and again and has that capacity to open towards the light, then that lifetime brings along so much more. There is then, like the gain of such a lifetime is so much bigger. And somebody would ask, what, what gain can there be for that which is already that divinity? The gain, it's, I mean, words are words. The gain is that the possibility of the experience of that own divinity is increasing, expanding, multiplying, intensifying. That's what we are here for. But if we live like this, then somebody who comes towards the end of the life is also not afraid of getting out of it I have a friend who is uh, very sick, but has been living consciously since a long time. And she just recently contacted, and it was like a goodbye letter. But it is clear there is not that fear. It is clear that somehow it has helped that, that life has been spent consciously. And now when it's going to a close, then okay, this chapter is over and the consciousness is again free of that connection with a physical body and can expand freely, beautifully. If we live our life and helplessly being pulled into negativity, then we live our life and our consciousness is always kept in that smallness, then also when we're reaching the end of a lifetime, usually it's full of terror because people are totally afraid of the unknown. Then all that tension one has gone through still has a certain amount of wealth with it, which will be there, but it has been a lo long slow, painful journey, if we learn to live consciously, if we learn to go for a moment instead of half asleep, but consciously, then there is so a nearly infinite greater benefit of this miraculous situation of consciousness, <laughs> being connected with a piece of meat, <laughs> with a body, with its limitations, and learn to deal with those situations. But it's also a possibility, the potential in the human form is simply staggering. The potential of consciousness, of being able to transform, to transcend, to break through barriers, to expand, is tremendous in that miraculous connection of consciousness and the human body. So it totally makes sense. There is no point in arguing. If you are already that divinity, then why should you practice? Why should you bother to even try to be conscious? because you are getting so infinitely more out of it. You're making use of that potential, of that possibility that is there, or then 
you are simply like a dead white dragged alone hitting always the head left and right going painfully through the whole story and coming out with a wealth of experience sure that is there but we need not suffer we need not go for that we can learn here now not wait for like sometime that big shift is going to happen and then all is right but we can learn here now to connect as good as we can and immediately our life is full of light and the more we are doing that the more it's manifesting the more powerfully it's there it does totally make sense to make these efforts not because we've out of the ID uh, as a business ID that I'm incomplete and I have to make myself complete. No, simply because it's just totally natural. And we have learned to be unnatural, but we have the right to become natural. But we naturally could be what we naturally should be, that going playfully, joyously through this time-space continuum, getting richer for the experience from moment to moment, that is the potential, that is the possibility. And it makes sense to make an effort, to catch the attention, to see when we are doing the exact opposite, and then simply learn not to do that anymore. <clears throat> okay, is by now another question that wants to be asked? Somebody who would like to come in? Uh, Andreas, there you are again. Hello. <laughs> in Buddhism, they say sometimes that Buddhism is like going against the usual stream. Um, and I, I understand it the way that, yeah, usually people are like, they, they want more pleasure or they want more security. And is it that what you mean when you say you, you should open up to that longing and orient? does it mean that you orientate yourself towards something completely different? And the main focus is on being present instead of being richer, happier, and <laughs> more status. Right. That's basically what I mean. Uh, and it's not simply Buddhism who goes against the general current, but anyone who consciously makes an attempt to live more conscious, to live more awake, is going against that Unfortunately, general current in this world. <laughs> Does it, it? It seems to me that sometimes it makes me feel like alone because I have sometimes like very. I, I sometimes I forget it completely, but if I aspire to it, I feel that I'm going in a different direction than anybody else, and very, very few people are understanding me, like in the town where I live in. Sometimes. I, if I start to explain it, I have the feeling they think I'm crazy. <laughs> yes. Well, that we have to take in our stride. As long as, as we are surrounded by people who are not interested in being carried along in the current, that in the habitual current, then uh, you may feel sometimes you are a bit lonely. But then this is also a temporary state because that feeling of lonely is also something that I'm holding on to that me, I'm, I need the, the confirmation by getting the feedback of people who think the way I think. There is absolutely nothing wrong with connecting with people who are on the same path. We can inspire each other. If we can find a group and come together, then that helps. But if we don't, then we just go our way. And sometimes you are a bit alone and people don't understand. And just, 
I, I know that so well. As long as I resisted that situation, it was painful. Then I thought, why? You know, I'm different and nobody understands. But when I stopped resisting, then it stopped being a problem. Stop resisting what? When I stopped resisting that uh, maybe the thoughts that go through this head are a bit different than the thoughts that go through most of the heads around. Uh, when I accepted that this is so, then it stopped being a problem. As long as I resisted and thought, well, why, why I'm different, why nobody understands, then it becomes heavy and painful. But if you think, okay, then I'm going my journey. And if you meet people, like-minded people, if you can connect and inspire each other, Great, wonderful. <laughs> but if that doesn't happen, it's still you have all the support from the subtle levels that as soon as you are opening towards the light, uh, then you are not alone. Then all those lightful forces come and support you. <laughs> Two weeks ago, I visited the local yoga center here. I mean, there's even a, a yoga center in this small town, which is exceptional. But mm -hmm. the day of the open door, where they present everything they do, and <laughs> in the end, it made me feel even more lonely because it, mm. it was very obvious that the things they are presenting is like how you can be happy with luck numbers and... Uh, the, 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 they gave a Zen meditation, but it was maybe it was much more like a relaxation access, a fantasy uh, journey. And <laughs> yeah, it, it felt complete that most, I mean, there might be some very good people there that I haven't contacted yet or meet, met yet, but a lot of the stuff that I encounter and the people that went there might seem much more be like very much locked in in the conventional stream of mm. try to get be more happy right you can of course and it's very popular you can do these kind of things hoping that you make your life a little bit more comfortable in one way or another or you can use yoga very much as a help to be to really help you to become more conscious to wake be more awake but still, then it has to be taught like this and people have to make the effort like this. <laughs> so everybody finds that place where they are somehow getting what they wanting. And if there are so many places like this now that you are describing that may be not going so very deep, then they still have their value because those people who go there, still, there is uh, more of a consciousness there than if they would go for God knows what else. Yeah, at least they are nice people and they are friendly right. and right. guarded. <laughs> hmm. I, I can appreciate that. So yes, right. In a way, it is a totally lonely journey. <laughs> We are alone. We came alone. We are alone in our journey. And then we go again alone. <laughs> but at the same time, we are not really alone. We are connected with everything. <laughs> and we may not be aware how much we are attracting energies that are along with us, that help us, that support us. If you are sincere, they come in strongly, and then now so that feeling of loneliness disappears. But it's always there. As soon as you are opening up to the light, there is also uh, there are all these forces that are with you. Still, we are alone in that sense that that decision has to come from ourselves, from moment to moment. Nobody is going to do that for us. But then, even if in human company, you may feel misunderstood, then that support is still there. Of, of subtle energies, not necessarily manifested as humans, but in that sense, 
you are not alone. Hmm. Shall we leave it at that? Yes. Yes. Okay. Hario. 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 If we listen, there is always that call. That call to come back. That call that creates that longing. If you are attentive, if you are awake, we become aware. It's not that longing is not longing for something that I have to achieve that somehow gets me finally fulfilled. I don't have to run and struggle and do so many things. That longing is the call to come home. Come back to yourself. Come back to that what you already are. You have never been anything else in reality. You just have forgot, forgotten it coming to this world and growing up being so locked in the habit of that me personality that it is buried, but still that longing is there. Longing for fulfillment, longing for peace, longing for settling down one's weary feet. <laughs> it is there in everybody. We just have to listen to it properly. And then it will bring us back home to that which is that pure divinity, that pure reality. And then the experience of that can blossom and unfold and unfold. And there is no end to that. I wish you all well. Are you home? Are you home? Are you?